today we're going to be talking with Senior District Judge Bill Harris and we're going to be talking primarily about uh, mediation and what it is and why it is and what we do when we do that and as always uh, we'll uh, try to respond to any questions that you the listener uh, send in to us. You can email us your questions and we'll be happy to try and attend to it. Now a senior district judge is, is a judge who has taken senior status and is somewhat retired, is that right? <clears throat> I'm retired under the uh, state retirement plan, but I still am authorized to sit as a visiting judge and uh, when I'm assigned to a case, I have the same powers as an active district judge. All right. But I have to be assigned by the the uh, presiding judge of the administrative region. And we still see you down there at the courthouse pretty regular. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I, I try to stay. I try to stay around. Now, you also do mediation. Yes, I do. That's, and and uh, arbitration. Mediation, arbitration, and I'm available as a, uh, a private judge under Chapter 151 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code. That's something a lot of people are not real familiar with, but it is used and it's can be very useful sometimes. We were talking about that a little bit before we started today, that very few people do know that you can you can have a, a mini trial, is what we used to call them, or a mm -hmm. private trial, um, and they're fairly rare. Uh, people don't use them a lot, uh, because in part because it's somewhat cost prohibitive, but there are times when it's really handy, uh, and why would people choose a private trial? Well. The, a lot of times it's cases where there's an interest in privacy, uh, there's an interest in, in, uh, in resolving the case quickly. Uh, our district courts, at least in Tarrant County, uh, they do an exceptionally good job, but they're very, very uh, overcrowded with cases, and it can take quite some time to get a case to trial in Tarrant County. Uh, if, if you hire an, an, a, a private judge, uh, as soon as the judge and the lawyers uh, engage in the agreement to to uh, to employ the judge, it's all in their hands from their own. The uh, lawyers and the judge schedule hearings, schedule trials, and schedule trial locations, and schedule everything about the trial. Let's focus on mediation for a second. I think a lot of people seem to think they know what mediation is, but then they're really surprised when they get there find out it's something different. Um, <clears throat> why do courts order mediation? Most of the time, if I have a client come in and say, well, uh, we'll have a trial, and it'll happen maybe eight months from now, but in the meantime, the court's going to send us to mediation first. And that's almost universal these days, uh, that the court wants you to go to mediation. Why is that? Well, I think that there's always been a, a, a tendency uh, under Texas law to uh, promote and encourage resolution of disputes between parties uh, without the, uh, the, the interference of a court or any other tribunal uh, to try to let people work their, their disagreements out without formal process and things like that. And I think mediation is just an extension of that. I think that the courts, uh, well, I, I, number one, I think that it's the, the courts recognize that as long as you're mediating something, you have a lot of control and a lot of flexibility. When you start a trial, you lose all of that flexibility. You lose all of that control, and it's all in the control of the trial judge at that point. So to facilitate agreements and to try to get parties to come to some reasonable resolution, uh, even on a temporary basis. I think that many of the judges uh, are using mediation to do that. I tell folks when they come to see me that nobody knows your stuff better than you do. Nobody knows what's good for your kids as well as you do. Uh, and no matter how good a job I do as, a, as a, an attorney, that poor judge is never going to have as much information as you have. So whenever possible, the smartest person to, to fix this problem is, is probably you. But <clears throat> I think you would agree with me, Judge, that when you're serving in your role as a judge, 
or when you're serving in your role as a mediator, one of those two roles gives you a whole lot more freedom and flexibility to fix what's broke. Well, Keith, I have many, many times told litigants in the courtroom just exactly what you brought up about the control and, and what's important about the case. And I would, uh, when I was a sitting judge, I would often be very blunt with people and say, look, I don't know either one of you. I don't like you. I don't dislike you. I have nothing, I have no feelings for you whatsoever. I don't know anything about what's important to you. Uh, but you know all these things. And I would love to be able to know everything about you to make a decision, but that's not going to be possible within the rules of evidence and the rules of civil procedure. So the more of your dispute that you can resolve yourself in a way that's important to you and perhaps not the mediator or the judge, the better off you are. The legislature doesn't give you quite the flexibility as a judge with regard to guidelines for, for how we deal with the children's issues, or, or the rules that we use to divide certain pieces of property. Uh, do you find that in mediation, the clients understand that, that they, that they actually have uh, a, a lot more freedom? Uh, the rules of civil procedure, the rules of evidence, the guidelines don't necessarily have to apply in a mediation situation. Right, right. <clears throat> Very true. And again, I think that when that's explained to people properly by their lawyers, I think they do understand that. I think they understand that they have more flexibility, they have more control, and they are, are running the show as opposed to the judge. That is presupposing their lawyers give them that information. Because if their lawyers have not prepared them for the mediation, then that is something that as the mediator I have to acquaint them with. And, and bring them up to speed on how valuable it is to resolve this case in mediation as opposed to litigation, how much, how important it is to preserve uh, their, their control of the case, and how much flexibility they're going to lose, and the judge is going to lose when, uh, when this case has to be tried under the rules of evidence and the rules of civil procedure. I don't think very many people truly know how a mediation works. Can you walk us through how a typical mediation uh, is conducted? Yeah. Uh, well, first, all mediators uh, approach things a little bit different. Uh, the way I approach a mediation is I try to meet with the Number one, I inquire from the lawyers if the parties want to have a face-to-face -face meeting with me prior to the mediation. Usually, they do not. So I sit down with each one of the parties individually with their lawyers, and I discuss the case, discuss what is important to them, and after I've discussed that with the case, gone over the realities of the case, the spreadsheets, the custody proposals, things like that, I begin working on how yeah, I determine where they are, each are, one is. And I start trying to determine how I can move them closer to a common goal. When you're serving as a mediator, I find my clients at least Oh, show him the, the evidence we've got. Show him that smoking gun, and, and that'll, that'll fix it all. And, and I'm not sure that, that people understand what, what the role of the mediator is, especially when we keep saying, oh, Judge, when do you see this? <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I I'll almost always have to bring up to the litigants in a, in a mediation is you don't have to prove anything to me. I'm not going to judge whether you're right, you're wrong. I'm not going to judge whether you're being greedy. I'm not going to judge whether the other side is being greedy because I'm not the judge of your case. I'm the mediator. I'm here selling a product, and the product I'm selling you 
is getting you out of this case with the least expense, the least turmoil, uh, the, the, the least stomach acid, the least uh, heartburn and everything else that we can do. I'm here to sell you your peace of mind. You just have to give me an idea of how we're going to go about selling it to the other side. Now, do you ever put the parties in the same room? No, I, I, uh, I, I, obviously you could do that. Uh, I've never I've seen never, it work. <laughs> I, I, I've never run into a situation where I think that was productive. Because typically in the mediation, uh, obviously the other side has a different approach. Each side has a different approach. And so tensions are a little bit high because you have two competing results. Uh, neither of which are going to happen. The, uh, the, re the end result is going to be somewhere in the middle uh, and it's going to be essentially the same thing that happens in a trial and what happens in a trial is nobody, very seldom does anyone get exactly what they want. Uh, I once had a, an old-time judge tell me that anytime he tried a case and one of the parties left smiling he felt like he had failed. So that's kind of the way the court works. If they're both mad at you, it must be a good it decision. It must be a good decision. <laughs> well, you know, emotions run deep in, in these kinds of cases. Uh, everything that's really important to you in the world, especially in family law, mm -hmm. uh, your business, your kids, your retirement, your house, everything's on the line. And unfortunately, <clears throat> what we find is that all of our clients receive a, a lot of well-intended but less than helpful <laughs> advice from their buddies at the bowling alley and their co-workers and mm -hmm. I mean I can't tell you how many times I was told but you know when when my cousin Leroy got divorced in Arkansas 12 years ago it didn't work out that way yeah. um, I find if you put both people in the same room that there's always one more gig they want to get in or they're posturing or worse the attorneys are posturing to put on the show and when when the mediator goes back and forth between the two rooms uh, there's less opportunity for everyone to tick each other off yeah I, I do get a little of that mm -hmm. in mediation sometimes and I try to shut it off pretty quick when the when the lawyers start making tacky comments to one another and things like that. I've, I always tell them, you know, there is not a damn thing productive you're doing here. All you're doing is, is just showing how immature you are uh, to the other side. And it's the same way with the parties. They're going to talk. They're going to make snide comments about their spouse. They're getting a divorce, which means their marriage is not supportable anymore. So they're going to make snide comments about the other spouse, and that's to be expected. What I've always told people is that the mediator's job is to bring people down from the irrational, down from the emotion, and get them leveled off to where they're thinking in business terms, not in emotional terms. When mediation first became popular, I'd say what? 20 years ago when we first really started seeing it uh, in family law. Yeah, 20, 20, 25 years, yeah, that's about right. I think our first reaction to it as, as trial lawyers was, why? why? Why would we do that? We're trial lawyers. Um, and, and I think it took a bit of time for the, the legal profession to really embrace mediation. Uh, it, it, they were kind of mediators were viewed as interlopers uh, and I don't think that mediation started blossoming until uh, some older more experienced trial attorneys and judges started serving as mediators mm -hmm. uh, where we, we I, I think the bar became a little bit more accepting of it uh, but you know if you can 
if you can help someone get divorced and, and save their dignity and keep most of their money in their pocket, it's generally a win. Uh, but I find, I, I choose mediators uh, based upon the personalities of my clients. There are some mediators who uh, I'll give them a big warm hug when they walk in the door and that's what that particular client needed uh, and some just need a stern talking to about okay yeah you may really really think that that you want his left arm hanging over your your fireplace but you know that's really not realistic why don't we move on do you have to give a lot of stern talks well you do uh and I think that, that that really has a couple of purposes. Number one, you've told them, as a good lawyer, you've told them what the result is likely to be under their given facts. When the mediator says, you know, basically the same thing the lawyer has been telling the person, uh, that gives a lot of credibility to the lawyer. It gives a lot of confidence to the client. Uh, as a mediator, sometimes you have to sit people down and say, you know, you have no, this will never, ever happen. So if, if you want to insist on a result that's absolutely ridiculous, we can end this right now because this isn't going to happen. You have to give them that talk and depending on the person, depending on their demeanor and all that, sometimes the talk is, is uh, less gentle than other times. I think the number approaches 95% of the cases, especially involving family law, are going to settle eventually without a final trial. I believe that's probably correct. And I think part of the reason for that is, one, as you said, the courts are very busy and it takes a while to get to court, but two, the outcome of most of these cases, to me, seems remarkably predictable. That if we know what the facts are, most of us know what the judge has to do with those kinds of facts. And knowing what the judge has to do, if he has those facts, mm -hmm. is, is where you can, I think, point out to the, the litigants that if you'd like a different outcome, <laughs> then perhaps you should negotiate in good faith for the parts that are important to you. Well, and I think that's one of the things that, that uh, the mediator has to do is to explain to the people that, you know, judges are under certain legal constraints just like, the, just like everyone else in a trial. Uh, contrary to what you see on television, things like that, uh, judges can't just make it up as they go along. Judges are bound by uh, the rules of civil procedure, the rules of evidence, uh, a whole plethora of Texas statutory law that touches on divorce and child custody, uh, all sorts of things like that. Plus they're bound under the rules of uh, judicial conduct, judicial decorum, and, and uh, all of the other uh, complexities of being a judge. So they have to do certain things uh, with certain types of evidence and if you have this type of evidence you know is going to come up you know that you know that there's something bad that is going to come out about one of the parties uh, you have to at least accept the fact that maybe it's worth some kind of a uh, taking less that you really want to keep that from happening because it certain evidence comes out, you might really, really get a bad result. So maybe you take a not so great result to avoid a disastrous result. What would you tell the uh, party who says, oh, but you know, once that judge hears this, you know, he wore white after Labor Day, or he had too much to drink New Year's Eve three years ago and kissed the neighbor. You're going to throw that law book out the window and you're going to do some justice. 
<laughs> yeah, sometimes the uh, sometimes the parties have to be given a little dose of reality as to as to what is important in in divorce cases and what is not. Obviously, you know, misconduct one of the spouses, adultery, things like that are not the kind of behavior that that is is admirable, and uh, and it certainly is under Texas law grounds for divorce and it is grounds for the court to consider in making a disproportionate reward of property. It is not, and, and I don't know if this is a statement about our society, uh, I don't know why, but any lawyer, any judge will tell you that adultery as a, as a fall ground is not going to be the big win of the lawsuit. It may it might move the award one to two percent one way or the other, but not much more than that. How much does it generally cost to uh, to do a mediation? And the judge says you're going to go to mediation. How much is it generally going to cost the parties? Well, it's uh, mediation fees vary. Most mediators charge by half day and full day. A few mediators charge a straight hourly. Uh, most mediators charge full day or half day retainers uh, simply because they they have to mark off that time that they have available. Uh, I think that mediation in this area runs anywhere from $400 for a half day mediation all the way up to, I think there's a couple of mediators who are charging uh, seven, $800 for a half day uh, and anything in between. For each side? Yes. Sir. Yes. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got to pay your lawyers. Correct. But when you think about the mediation, Keith, and I think this is one of the things that people have to accept, if you pay a good lawyer a half-day mediation fee and you pay me my $600 fee and you resolve the case favorably and you avoid paying that same lawyer uh, for eight, ten hours of preparation. You avoid paying any expert witnesses that you have to call to establish value and things like that. And you avoid the, uh, the one day to one and a half days in court time for the lawyer. All of a sudden, I become very, very cheap and the lawyer's time in the mediation becomes very, very much a bargain. So you look at it that way and, it's, and, you, and you have to look at it that way. You can spend a pretty decent amount in mediation and still come out way ahead on the end result if you, uh, if, if you, if you just work at it. What happens if we go to mediation and we can't reach an agreement? Well, then you're going to have a trial. Uh, I, one of the things that we, we have seen, and I, I, I think that this is something that happens, I'm not sure how often, because I'm not sure how often I saw this as a judge. Uh, sometimes you'll have a mediation that you can resolve some of the issues. Maybe not everything, but some of the issues. And if you can resolve some of the issues, every issue you resolve it shortens the trial. Mm -hmm. And if you can resolve five of the issues and only have to, to try two of them, you've saved yourself a lot of effort on, on a trial that you try seven issues. All right, so my client and I are sent into mediation and we prepare before we go see you. And I think most of the time, You'll have us write up a synopsis of what the issues are and as a starting ground yes. before you ever even show up for the mediation. And, and we have our opening position. And then the other side has their position. And uh, we're kind of going back and forth between those to see if we can reach somewhere in the middle. Um, if we reach an agreement that day in mediation, how does it work from there? How do we turn that into a judgment? <clears throat> well, under Texas law, 
if you reach a full agreement, a mediated settlement agreement, uh, that mediated settlement agreement has to be reduced to writing. And if that mediated settlement agreement is reduced to writing with all the statutory language that is required uh, by the, uh, the Texas Family Code and the Rules of Civil Procedure, you are entitled to a judgment on that mediated settlement agreement. And a judge cannot refuse to grant the judgment on that mediated settlement agreement if it's done correctly. Sometimes I get told by my client, let's not bother with mediation because that so-and-so is never going to agree to anything. Um, it's, I find that it's been very rare that a judge would agree with that and, and say, no, you don't have to mediate. But uh, what would you say the success rate is on mediations, generally? I think that uh, I don't really have a mathematical formula. I can tell you that I, I can categorically tell you that there is a much higher success rate in mediation than there is a failure rate. Okay. Because people in their hearts they want to settle they want to settle the case they don't want to have a disinterested third party rule on cases they want to have a disinterested third party listen to them and work something out for them but that's that's just that's it's my perception of what most of these folks are what happens if we reach an agreement and somebody says, you know what, I've changed my mind about three hours later? Well, that's most unfortunate <laughs> under Texas law. <laughs> yeah. Once that mediated settlement agreement is signed, if it is in the proper form and uh, has all of the, the language that's required by Texas law, uh, it's not revocable. And it, it can't be you you can't uh, you can't take it back. The uh, court is going to grant a judgment on that mediated settlement agreement, and your remedy at that point lie in your post post judgment, just like any other trial. Well, but that's that, actually that, one of the advantages of mediation, isn't it? Exactly. I always say a mediated settlement agreement, in lawyer speak, has the same legal effect as a rendition by the court. In other words, if the court renders judgment, then you're entitled to a written judgment that reflects that rendition. Mediation, if you have a mediated settlement agreement, that is the functional equivalent of a judge's rendition. You are entitled to a judgment on that agreement. That makes it stronger <coughs> than what we call a Rule 11 agreement between the parties. Yes, because Texas Rules of Procedure Rule 11 agreement can be revoked. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the one of the people watching here wants to know how community property is divided between spouses in a divorce. <clears throat> You've sat as, both as a mediator and as a judge. How would you address those that issue in under each one of those roles? Well, the law is, as you know, is is very simple on how the community property is divided. The law just says. It is divided in a manner that is just and right, considering the uh, the facts and the parties. Is so that always very wrong? Is that always fifty fifty? No. <laughs> it's one of the one of the fallacies of the state of Texas. Is uh, everybody says, well, Texas is a fifty fifty state. Well, that's not not necessarily so. Fifty fifty is a presumption. You know, an even division is a presumption. But that's not what the Texas law says. <clears throat> Texas law uses the term just and right. And, and that takes into consideration the income earning ability of the parties, the size of the estate, uh, the needs of the children, all of these factors. The judge, can, the judge has an incredibly broad discretion on that. And appellate courts will very, very rarely overturn a, uh, a mathematical division if there's any evidence to to uh, to support that division, so that's that's the rules for a division. Now, we get back to mediation. Uh -huh. You can divide a, a, a 
uh, you can divide property that's just and wrong or that's unjust and wrong in mediation if that's what you both agree to. But the, the court is, is bound by the just and right division, which is just all the factors combined. Uh, you, that's, you give that up. You give the freedom up when you, uh, when you, when you and ask ready for trial. I find that there are certain <coughs> kinds of cases where mediation is, is vastly superior because the parties have concerns that it's very difficult for a judge or a jury to deal with, like cash flow and tax considerations and who's going to run the business uh, and, and uh, things like that where rarely do, I, rarely do I encounter an estate where they have the liquidity for a clean 50-50 division anyway. But, but there are some issues that uh, at first blush you might say, well this really isn't an even division of the estate, but it's the only one that will work. Uh, given the circumstances that the people have, yeah, I, I think that's real common. And, and uh, one of the one of the prime examples of that is when you start talking about liquidity, leverage, things like that. If you've got, <clears throat> if there may be advantage, there may be a tax advantage or some other advantage in, in some of these estates to giving up. A portion of the estate, giving up a larger portion of the estate in order to retain another asset. In other words, am I willing to give up more than half the cash to uh, retain the the uh, the lakefront property that I, I I like so much, or am I willing to give up more than half the cash to to get some other advantage that means something to me personally? that is not going to mean anything to a judge looking at it in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between mediation and arbitration? You do both. Right. So what's the difference? Well, mediation is where I help you divide your property. I help you divide your assets, make your agreement. Arbitration is where I listen to your story, I listen to the other story, and I make what's called an award. And that is essentially, I rule on how the estate gets divided. And one of the advantages of arbitration is that you can, you can make any kind of an agreement you want as to the rules for arbitration. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can say, we're not going to follow the rules of civil procedure. Or we are going to follow certain rules. We are going to allow this type of evidence, but we're not going to allow this. You can fashion your, your rule. You're not bound by the, by the statutory rules. And the arbitrator's award, if, uh, the, or, if the arbitration agreement between the parties, the agreement to arbitrate, is done correctly, uh, you're entitled to a judgment on an arbitrator's award, and the uh, I, I'm pretty sure your appeal is limited to the the uh, reasonableness of the arbitration agreement. A lot of folks <clears throat> wonder. Well, I think we've seen some statistics that say that more than 50 percent of the family law cases that are in the courthouse today are what we call pro se cases, which is a five dollar Latin term for ain't got no lawyer. Uh, and and it's, it's lay people providing their own divorce. And we could spend hours talking about the pitfalls of, of trying to try your own divorce case or family law case or any other kind of case. Uh, it's almost as bad as trying to defend yourself on a criminal charge with, without a lawyer. Um, but when it comes to mediation, is a pro se party to a mediation at a disadvantage? I think that a pro se litigant 
in a in a contested proceeding is always going to be at a disadvantage because the the <clears throat> one party is, is getting advice and counsel from someone with training and education in the law and the pro se party is not so I think that's a natural disadvantage that's created whether it be in in uh, uh, the the trial process the pretrial process in mediation or in arbitration I think that uh, that you, you know the pro se litigant is at a definite disadvantage having said that as a trial judge uh, I can't consider that if I'm trying a lawsuit as a judge I cannot consider uh, the fact that a person is, is pro se and I in other words I cannot help them uh, legally without as a legal matter harming the other party because divorce is an adversary proceeding it's not a proceeding that has to be uh, it doesn't have to be unpleasant or anything but it is what the law calls an adversary proceeding and so you can't the judge cannot think of pro se living it uh, under, under the law. Well, in, in court, the judge has to treat the uh, the uh, pro se litigant just and hold them to the same standards they would any other attorney. Exactly. So it's, it's the same. It's the same principle as if <coughs> I'm sitting as the judge and you come into the courtroom representing one client and a first year law student that's never tried a lawsuit comes in representing the other. Well, that's not really fair. But there's not anything I can do about it. I, there, there's no, uh, there's, you, you can't, you can't handicap cases like you do a horse race. <laughs> well, do you have any more freedom in mediation to level the playing field uh, when when one party chooses to go without counsel? As the mediator, I, I'm not so sure that I do. Uh, I have to remain as the neutral. Uh, as the mediator. Now, one of the things that mediation with a pro se is that if the pro se litigant is at, is at a more level playing field simply because that pro se litigant doesn't have to know any law or procedure to participate in, in mediation and to work something out in mediation. Uh, I still think I still think this, that uh, anyone who represents themselves has a fool for a client, if for no other reason than the great difficulty in writing the judgment and reading the judgment. Uh, a typical divorce decree today is going to run 30 plus pages typed, sometimes as much as 60 or 70, and there's a whole bunch of $5 words in there that... Uh, the family code has defined differently than when we're sitting around the coffee table talking and I think it is all but impossible for a lay person to adequately read, review and understand these documents uh, and understand whether or not the lawyer on the other side has written them in such a way to be truly even handed or not. Uh, I think that's, I think that's very, very accurate. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would agree about uh, representing oneself. I've said it before, I've been a lawyer for almost 37 years and I've been a judge for 24 of those years. I would not represent myself in a contested proceeding under any circumstances. And that's because I've been a lawyer for 37 years and I've been a judge for 24 of them. Well, and, and let's face it, you and I do understand the, the law that we'd be facing if we were to go to court, but when you're a party and the emotions are involved and it's your stuff and your kids, uh, there's a chance that perhaps you won't be completely objective about it all. Uh, well, I think that's one of the things that uh, you pay for when you hire a lawyer at least one of the things you're paying for with a lawyer is what the, the law calls cool reflection on the facts of the case. Uh, you can't be, 
you can't be completely emotionless about your own case. A lawyer can and should be. Now, a lawyer is under an obligation to zealously represent you, but a lawyer is also there to look at a case logically and apply the law to your facts and do so without passion, without prejudice, anything like that, and give you a, a judgment of, as far as what that lawyer thinks the result of this case might be. It's even more important when you go to a mediator that you, you're, you're, part of what you're paying for is for someone to listen to the facts that knows the law, knows how these cases get resolved, and will listen to the case, take the emotion out of it, and try to give you some idea as to a reasonable resolution of the case that's going to be advantageous to you and your spouse. I find as a as a, when I'm representing folks, I prefer to use mediators who have your level of experience both as attorneys and on the bench, uh, because I find that uh, it's you have a credibility in your assessment of what um, uh, the court is likely to do with a given set of facts. Uh, Sometimes, sometimes even good lawyers drink the Kool-Aid, and they get a little over overconfident in terms of what their case is going to be in court, and and you know how how, how their biorhythms are up, and so they're going to get a good day in court. And <clears throat> I've been doing this 32 years, and I can tell you, I don't think I've ever had a case where I hit a home run on every pitch. That's you. Yeah. I think that's pretty typical of most lawyers, and uh, and that's that's something that you know you have to keep in mind. When do you think is the best time, the optimum time, for mediation to take place during a case, at the front end or towards the back end, or <clears throat> I think there's there's so many variations on that. I think that. Uh, when you're talking about a, a custody case, often uh, the parties will want to mediate or the judge will want uh, the parties to mediate a temporary order. They want a mediation before, uh, you know, right as soon as the case gets started. Uh, in, a, in a financial case and one involving community property, <clears throat> that's absolutely impossible. The, uh, the, the parties have to have time to develop the case, to do this discovery, to determine, because a lot of the times parties don't really know exactly what their assets are until they sit down and start looking them over, looking at numbers and looking at, uh, at institutions and things like that. <clears throat> so I think that the judge has to allow uh, a, a level of, of preparation for mediation on, uh, on the property cases and to some extent on the final outcome on the on the custody case also. Yeah, I, I, I would find it, I think, very difficult to mediate prior to temporary order simply because uh, we're unlikely to have gotten a hold of all the documents mm -hmm. that the parties may know some of what's going on, but I'm not sure the lawyers do yet right. in terms of what's in the retirement account or or you know how this uh, uh, what's the what's the actual market value of the house or, or that sort of thing now I've been seeing and I, I've mentioned this to you before there are groups of uh, folks out there organizations or marriage counselors who say you don't need lawyers we'll just we'll help you mediate this thing don't even go see a lawyer, don't go file for divorce. We can take care of this and we can mediate it ourselves. <laughs> have you seen some of these, these outfits? I've, I think we all have. Uh, I think we've all seen them advertised. <clears throat> uh, I, number one, most of these outfits are on a very, very, they're right on the very edge of unlicensed practicing of law. And, and that is a crime in the state of Texas. You can't practice law 
without a law license. And <clears throat> whether you say you're just helping with a divorce or not, you can say anything you want to. If you are giving legal advice, you are practicing law. And uh, the unauthorized practice of law committees, uh, they, they stay busy full time trying to track <laughs> these people down and, uh, and get them stopped from, uh, from doing this. But uh, I think it's one of those things where uh, the, the consumer has to really be aware of the downfalls. Uh, there are probably some people who are, you know, uh, have some kind of nursing training, uh, you know, some kind of basic level of training that could actually treat certain minor medical conditions. Would you want them to treat you if you're if they're not a doctor? I would not, and I don't think anyone else would. But but that's the that's the, sort of the same thing with these these services. Uh, they kind of know enough law to where they can just get you into a lot of trouble. That instead of costing uh, a, a reasonable fee to get a divorce, you'll get to pay a big big fee to have a lawyer fix what they broke and then start on the divorce. I've had clients, potential clients, come to see me and say, we got us one of them internet divorces mm -hmm. or we, uh, we mediated this, it's all done, just need you to write it up. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with, with both of those, of course, being there are no internet divorces um, and these, these mediations that they have put together sometimes costing thousands and thousands of dollars and all we mediated for eight months, you know, and all of this are unenforceable as all get out. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, <clears throat> it's astounding the things that, uh, I've, I've heard horror stories as a judge of uh, people spending, you know, ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 with non-lawyers uh, and then getting an agreement that they can't you know, they can't get it reduced to writing, they can't, you know, this, it's just just completely unenforceable and useless. And, uh, and plus, if it's, you know, they make an agreement and and they're all happy and everything else, then one of them says, yeah, wait a minute, I'm not going to do that anymore. Well, there's no, there's no recourse, you're, you're just stuck. A lot of folks don't understand that the, the whole purpose for a mediation is it, it's not just open negotiations like it would be for a union contract or something. You have to be settling a lawsuit. A mediated settlement agreement is a, a, a specific, defined document. Just saying we have an agreement and, and we got it notarized and sprinkled pixie dust on it does, doesn't get it done, all right? Um, and and I, I, I guess a lot of people don't understand that, that, that a mediated settlement agreement is a special animal. Mm -hmm. It's defined by the family code, it's a protected instrument, and frankly, if you don't have a mediator, it's not a mediated settlement agreement. No. Okay, and it can be revoked at any time, and you've just wasted your time and a bunch of money, and you may have had an agreement, you thought, until someone actually looks at what it's supposed to say legally, and let's say you run out and you spend months mediating this thing, and then you go try to find a lawyer to file the divorce so that you can turn it into something uh, to settle the case. Well, in Texas, there's a 60-day waiting period after you file it before you can do that. And a lot of folks change their mind, you know, and circumstances do change, okay? When we made this agreement, you know, my car was running, and now it's not. Uh, and it can be really problematic. Um, then we also have the folks where the court orders a mediation. I'm going to send you all to mediation. I want you all to try and do the smart thing before you make me come as the court of last resort. Yeah. And then they don't go. That's, that's not, depending on your judge, you, you may be pretty, you may not be very happy with that because in order to do mediation, it's just like, 
it's a court order. That's what it is before it is anything else. And when a judge orders you to do something, you pretty well have to comply with that order, or you could be, you know, you could be found in contempt of court for not to, not to complying with the mediation order. I don't think the judges hold people in contempt very often. But you also might be, you know, the judge, you're ready for trial, and you've waited 18 months, and all of a sudden the judge says, what's the result of the mediation? Oh, we decided not to do it. Well, wait a minute, I ordered you to do it. Yeah, but we decided to not. That was one of your orders we didn't want to pay any attention to. That didn't go over well. You might find yourself kicked off the trial docket, and you might have to wait another six months to, to get a new trial setting. Just... Uh, it just puts you in a bad situation. It puts the judge in a bad situation. How often do you find that, that people show up for mediation with zero preparation? Well, unfortunately, it's like we've discussed earlier, Keith. Uh, when I was a judge for 24 years, and, and sadly, I had a lot of lawyers show up with zero trial preparation. Mediation is just like a trial. Uh, good lawyers prepare for mediation just like they prepare for a trial. And sadly, <coughs> occasionally you'll have a lawyer that will show up to mediation with no preparation whatsoever. And, and those are the cases where there's a real low probability of success on that because the unprepared lawyer in a trial, the unprepared lawyer in mediation is the same animal, it's an unprepared lawyer. And, and they've not done their job, they've not earned their money, and, uh, and they're not really providing a service to anybody. But, uh, but uh, unfortunately it does happen. Well, I think when you have those circumstances, many times I think sometimes that can give lawyers a really bad name because the parties don't understand what the issues are. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm talking to a client about mediation, I'll tell them, look, you know, if we go to trial, here is our very best day in court, okay? You may win on three of these issues, and, and you, know, you have to decide what is a win, okay? I asked my client, what are, the, what are the three things that are most important to you? Mm -hmm. uh, and and if, if they're really unreasonable, uh, then we talk about you know, what would be a more realistic goal for them to have. When you're going into mediation, if you don't know what your best day in court is, you know, a lot of times the reason to go to mediation is you've looked at what your best day in court is and you don't like it. Right. Okay. Uh, it's not very good because the judge cannot award you that. I don't care if you want all the retirement. The <laughs> judge can't give you all the retirement. If you want all the retirement, we have to negotiate that, which means mediation. And, and that's exactly what happens when you don't have a lawyer that's prepared for mediation. They don't know their best day in court. And it, obviously, if they don't know that, they cannot possibly know their best day in mediation. And that's one of the things I try to get up front is I try to get it from the party and the lawyer both. What is, what is a big win today? Tell me what, if, if you leave here today, well, tell me what result you would be extremely, absolutely, perfectly happy with. That's where we start. That's what's not going to happen, but that's where we're going to start. And when the lawyers and the client doesn't even know, or when the client looks at the lawyer and says, I don't know, what is my best day? And the lawyer says, well, let me think about that. <laughs> at $400 an hour. Yeah, at $400 an hour. Give me a few minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and where I'm sitting there, I, I always tell them, I say, you know, three, I, I charge you three hundred dollars an hour. That's awfully expensive for me to observe you think. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we go into a mediation, I try and tell my clients we're going to walk in and we're going to make an offer, and and that's going to establish a floor to the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And then the other side is going to make an offer, and it's going to be their Christmas card list 
uh, all their wishes and it's going to establish a ceiling and if we're lucky we're going to settle it somewhere in between those two. Um, occasionally you'll have lawyers who don't don't follow that thing and their second offer is even higher than their their first offer was for the ceiling uh, but I find that's fairly rare but I don't think there's any any substitute for the preparation which is why you send out questionnaires to everybody yes I do so that at least you <coughs> made them think about it enough to fill out a form and, and, and most of the cases, I actually get those questionnaires back, but sometimes I don't. <laughs> if we're talking about, instead of community property, we're talking about uh, visitation issues, um, is there a difference there between what a judge can do, and we've got about five minutes left, and, and what a mediator can work out for you? Oh, absolutely. Many of them work at any. You can you can come to almost any agreement you can think of <clears throat> with regard to your possession schedule, access schedule, all of these things. Uh, the only reservation on that is if the judge has to approve your agreement, unless the judge finds it is not in the child's best interest. Mm -hmm. But there is a an appellate case out of Texas called Henry Stephanie Lee that makes that such an onerous process. For all intents and purposes, a judge has to approve I mean, an, an agreement yeah, unless there, there are just, well, I've always said, you know, you can make any kind of agreement and as long as it's not an agreement for one of the parties uh, to live with the child in a tent on the I-35 median, you know, that, it's probably going to get approved, uh, but yeah, there's visitation and possession. It's like anything else. Just if you can, if you can come up with it, it can probably be worked out. And that's better than guidelines. Okay, we have a guideline visitation schedule that says, okay, the first third and fifth weekends of the month, thirty days of summer, this kind of thing. It's a one size fits all template. And, and it, it sucks. It almost has to be because the judge does not have the, 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 the ability to spend the kind of time the mediator does. Uh, judges, I think that uh, in Tarrant County, I believe the average pending caseload in each of the six family courts is about 2,800 pending cases wow. at any one time. So these judges, uh, there are two judges in each court, the, the district judge and the associate judge, and then there are two, or there are three Title IV-D child support uh, court judges. These judges work incredibly hard. Uh, they, they work incredibly hard, but they have to move those cases. They have to have, uh, they can't spend the time to craft and fashion and, you know, these these uh, these uh, creative schedules the way that uh, that a mediator can or the parties can. Well, and no couple in their right mind wants to live by that schedule for no. the next 10, 12 years because Aunt Bessie never shows up on the right weekend. Uh, stuff happens and it makes it very very difficult. Yeah. And so I that's one of the things I try and urge people with mediation is if you don't like that terrible schedule that's the one size fits all, then let's sit down and talk about it and see what we can do. Yeah. Um, all in all, I think, and I'm wondering if you agree, the practice of trial law has been improved by mediation. Oh, I think definitely it has. Yeah. I think the quality of the practice has improved. I think the satisfaction with the results is improved. I really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you very much for having me here. Bill Harris and mediator and uh, this is our legal hour from Get Legal and uh, we are now, able, you're able to watch us now on Spotify and iTunes and you can listen to the entire legal hour series. Uh, you can also find our podcast under a channel uh, under the law firm of Bailey and Gallion's Attorney at Law and I'm Keith Spencer. We've enjoyed visiting with Judge Harris today. We look forward to uh, meeting with you again in the future. Thank you.
Thank you.